Okay, let's get started. So, um, I haven't seen you in a week. Uh, it got cold again, but you're all back, which is good. Um, because we're a Monday, Wednesday class, we miss Monday due to the holiday, and so uh, you're probably a little, we're a little bit behind the rest of your classes, perhaps, but we'll make up for it. Um, the last time we met, we were talking about block ciphers, and we're going to spend probably a week or two on block ciphers, so uh, let's get back to it. Are there any questions or concerns before we start back into where we were? All right, so let's just recall real quick, I think it's here, a block cipher is going to be an algorithm. <coughs> and this algorithm takes two inputs. What are they? The key, the key and the, uh, the plain, text. Text. The plain text and the key. And the key is the thing with the hatch mark on the diagram. And then out comes the cipher. The cipher text. And the definition of a block cipher has nothing to do with security definition of a block cipher, just syntactically, like what makes you a block cipher, is one, you got to have the plain text and the key coming in and the ciphertext coming out. Two, the plain text and the ciphertext have to be the same size, same number of bits, right? Yep. So, <clears throat> why am I not writing here? I thought I just picked a pen. Writing. One time I did this for half an hour, it turned out I had the, the wrong end of the pen because there was an eraser side and a plain side. It's not going to write for me. I think I said allow editing. Oh, that's a bummer because I want to write today. This worked last time, didn't it? And the wire for the plain text and the ciphertext both have the same number of bits. And the final requirement that I really want you to, to remember, if the key is fixed, if we put a certain value on that wire, and we get a... Uh, what? Permutation from plain text to ciphertext. What does that mean? One to one. Okay, and what does that mean? For a certain input, you get the same output. You get a okay. output. For, the, for the same input, you always get the corresponding output. That's just determinism. It means we don't flip any coins. If I put in David today and I get XYZ tomorrow, I put David in, I get XYZ. It's never, as long as the key stays fixed, we get the same map. But one to oneness is another requirement which says. It goes the other way as well. So you can think of it as invertible, right? So that means that. If I invert X, Y, Z, I go back to David. I don't have to go, oh, I'm not sure which, which thing goes back to. There are two or three of them or seven of them, right? Another way of saying the same thing, two different inputs always map to two different, two different outputs, right? You can't have two inputs map to the same output. If you do, it's not a one-to-one -one map. And we need this one-to-one -one mapping because we need to be able to decipher. We need this block cipher to be invertible <coughs> under a given key. Remember this? Yep. yep. Okay. That was just the syntax, just to qualify as a block cipher. If you want to be a good block cipher, it gets more complicated, right? This is where we had this game, and we had the game of the two black boxes. One of them is this perfect block cipher. It's, an, it's a random permutation. It's a one-to-one -one mapping from n bits to n bits, just like a block cipher is, but it's not an algorithm. It's this ideal thing that you couldn't really implement called a random permutation pi we use. And then the other black box is this real world implementation that you care about, that you're trying to design or test or validate or evaluate. And, you're, and the test is you hand these two boxes to an adversary and say, adversary, can you tell which one is which? Not, can you extract the key? Not, can you understand the contents of the ciphertext? Not, any other qualitative thing. Just can you tell me which one's pi and which one's the block, block cipher under examination? And if that adversary cannot do it better than with a trivial amount of advantage above 50-50, if, if it's just essentially a 50-50 chance which one 
the adversary chooses is the block cipher and which one's the pi, then you say the block cipher is good. It's hard to distinguish from random, right? If it's trivial to distinguish from random, you're like, ah, oh, that one's the pi and that one's the block cipher. Block, block cipher is bad. You should not be able to tell it apart. It should be so close to random that you can't tell. So then we moved on to take a specific example that we called this block cipher X, which is the crappiest block cipher imaginable. Well, maybe not, right? Maybe the identity map is the crappiest block cipher imaginable. It is a, the identity map is a block cipher, yes? yes? When I say the identity map, what I mean is the block cipher that ignores the key and just put, gives out whatever it goes in. You know, it's just, it's just straight wires from input to output. That's a block cipher because it has two inputs and an output. The input and output are the same size. And for any key, you get a one-to-one -one map. Namely, you get the identity, which is a one-to-one -one map. And you get it no matter what. That's probably worse than X, right? X is only slightly better. X is this block cipher that all it does is XOR the key into the plain text and give you the ciphertext. So we, we then undertook to attack X under the definition of security where the game is this one versus that one, black box versus black box. And I said, can you tell apart X under an unknown secret hidden key within that black box from pi, a random permutation? And several of you came up with different attacks. Um, and our synopsis was, if you only get one query, if you only get to ask, ask one input plain text, and you only get to receive one ciphertext back as a response in this game, now you're the adversary in this conversation, then X is secure. You can't tell it apart. At, you have no advantage whatsoever to tell it apart from random. Because if I give you an input, uh, I, if I give X an input and it XORs with a random string, it's going to get a uniformly random output of the same length. You can't win. But if you get two queries, then you win, right? You win with overwhelming probability. Uh, so let's, let's review the game. You put in, I said, I think we decided we were going to put zero in. Now, if you put zero in, out comes the key, if we're in the world of X. Out comes a random string, a completely random 64-bit string, if you're in pi. Now, after just querying this one input, you can't get any advantage because pi gives you a random string, x gives you the key, but the key is a random string. So there's no statistical bias. There's no test you can run. There's nothing you can know just as a result of that first query. But if you do it again, and I heard several people suggest variations on a theme. People said put in all ones. That's what I have suggested on the slide. Some people said, just feed C back into it again, right? Whatever came out, put it back in. What will happen if you're on, in this world of X and you put C back in? You get zero, right? Now, it could happen that pi also has this behavior. Very unlikely. But it could happen. But if you put P, if you put zero in and you get C out, or C is some string, you put C in, and you get non-zero out, what can you conclude? It's pi. It's pi. What's, what's the probability that it's pi? Uh, one. It's probably one, 100 percent. Right? X always behaves in the following way. If you put zero in and you get something out, you put the something back in, you get zero, 100 percent of the time. If that doesn't happen, you know this is pi. I'm sorry. Yeah, this is pi. And therefore, you've won the game in two queries. You've distinguished the two. If you put zero in, you get something out. You put something back in, and you get zero back, you can conclude it's x with very high probability, almost one, but not quite. So there, it could have happened the other way. But in any case, you overwhelmingly, with high, high probability, win this game in two queries, which means x is terrible, right? X is terrible. Okay. So that was really the, uh, the takeaway. By the way, um, you can win this game in two queries 
by putting in anything you want for the first query. You can put p equals a, where a is just any string you like, and then p equals b, and you'll win. As long as what? There's one tiny, tiny caveat I have to mention. A is not equal to b. A is not equal to b. Don't ask the same thing twice. That's the same thing as asking only one query, and we said in one query you can't win. So ask two different inputs. And you can win. How would you? So trivially, if, if A is 0, then we have the key and anything. But I don't, I'm, I'm saying, I'm saying let's, let's do a different experiment. You don't get to ask the query. Someone else asks it for you, but tells you, hey, I shoved A into this box. Out came X of A. So you give an A, an X of A, which is the black box output. You give an B, an X of B. And that's it. You don't get to query. But you should still be able to tell me if this is pi or with overwhelming probability this is X. Yeah, because if, if you XR C with B, you get the key. What's C? C is the ciphertext. That, that is, you get the, what is whatever output you get. X A. So X, if I XOR X A and A, I get the key. If I XOR X of A and A, yeah, I get the key. And then I use the same key to verify if, you know. Okay. Yeah. You can get. Okay, that's equivalent to what I was going to say. So I was going to say test if A X or B is equal to what. You can do this. The suggestion by this gentleman was A X or A equal equal B X or B. It's the same thing because you can just do the arithmetic, do the algebra. In any case, um, down here in this example, we had set A equal to all zeros and B equal to all ones, and so it simplifies it a bit. But basically, for any two distinct inputs, you can do this test. If it doesn't, if these are not equal, you're sure that it's pi. They are equal, you're virtually sure that it's this terrible block cipher X. Sounds good? Okay. This was the uh, probability that um, you, you say, oh, it's X, I'm almost positive, and you're wrong. There's a one in a very, very small chance. There's a one in a large number, over a large number, that it's one in 10 to the 20 that you're wrong. Okay. I'm going to go on to the next set of slides. In this next set of slides, <clears throat> we're going to start developing a good block cipher. Really? I didn't set the permissions right. I'm like all proud of myself that I got it all ready ahead of time. again. All right. So let's build a better block cipher. This better block cipher is called DES, D-E-S. Some people call it DES, but most people say DES in the crypto community. It stands for the very generic sounding data encryption standard. It has a 64-bit block size. So how many bits is the plain text? 64. And how many bits is the cipher text? 64. 64. Right. Block cipher, so they have to match. You can't have any expansion. However, this key is only 56 bits, so there's no requirement that the key size is the same. The history of this thing, uh, the NBS, National Bureau of Standards, went to IBM back in the early 70s and said, hey, crypto has been the purview of the military all this time, but now we want a standard that people can use in corporate environment, commercial environment. 
So this guy named Horst Feistel, who was already interested in crypto back then in the 70s, developed this thing they called it Lucifer. We, we briefly went over this already, yeah? The NBS, not trusting IBM entirely, and also being a cloistered environment, said, we better show this to the NSA and see what they say. The NSA said, okay, we like it, except Lucifer had a 64-bit key. And the NSA didn't like that. So they tweaked it, and they changed it to, to 56 bits, which definitely added a weakness, right? Because if you're going to exhaustively try all keys, it's a lot faster to have to f try. How many fewer tries is this? It's on the order of 256 t times fewer keys, one 256th of the key space, 8 bits. Um, they also tweaked something called the S boxes, and I'll tell you about those later. And people at that time, all 12 of them who cared, um, back in the day, in the 70s, very few people knew what cryptography even was. There were some privacy advocates screaming from the rooftops into deaf ears of the people who didn't care about crypto, uh, saying, the NSA has weakened our cipher for sure, and maybe they've even added a backdoor when they change these S boxes, maybe they're making it so they can exploit it. Sorry, how much easier from si is it from six going from 64 bit to 56? One two fifty sixth as many. So, all I'm saying is two fifty six divided by two to sixty four is one over two fifty six. Okay. Or one over two to the eighth. Um, as it turns out, now that we understand better about differential cryptanalysis and other techniques that we're not going to discuss in this class, it appears the NSA was actually strengthening DES in this respect with the S-boxes, but weaken it, weakening it in with respect to its key size, presumably because they could break 56-bit keys and no one else in the world could at that time. But it's still these days hard to do. If you had a, a bunch of GPUs in the basement, you could probably do it in an hour these days. But uh, it's not something you can do on your smartphone. All right, so DES was adopted by uh, NBS. Now, these days it's called NIST. Have you heard of NIST? They have a really big campus over here. Yeah. yeah. And NOAA. This is where the quantum computing group is, in fact. A um, bunch of Nobel Prize winners in physics over there who are usually have a joint appointment here at CU. And it was ratified as FIPS 46-3. FIPS is a common um, prefix for standards in this country, along with ANSI also is another common standards body within the United States, their commercial interests. ISO, ISO, international standards. This uh, DES lived in its glory from the mid-70s all the way up to the year 2000. And then it was officially retired. So nobody uses DES anymore except some people. Um, as usual, even though a standard becomes deprecated or uh, retired officially, it continues to see use. Why? Testing. I'm going to guess. I'm gonna test. Awesome change. Sorry? Cost of changing it. Yeah, it's expensive, right? If you've got, you know, all the ATMs out there using DES and then you want to update them, that requires you actually physically go out and replace it. You can't do, you can't do, uh, what is it called, OTA updates over the air, which is probably dangerous for ATMs to be able to do over the air updates to their firmware. But if you have to go replace all the machines, that's expensive. Or even if it's just software only, <coughs> it's still a complicated matter to update in synchrony all possible clients and servers to use a new protocol. And you typically, what they do is they have protocol negotiations, so you can say to both ends, do you speak this more advanced, more up-to-date? But it's not trivial. And so for that reason, DES is still used. It's still used in the banking industry. Now, um, it's not used with a 56-bit key. We'll explain, I'll explain to you later what they actually do to strengthen it against uh, exhaustive key search. But any questions about this, the history, 
and its parameters. Okay, this is what the key looks like. So Lucifer had a 64-bit key. We could number the bits from left to right, from K sub 0 to K sub 63. Uh, but NSA said, you know what, we can use some parity bits. What's a parity bit? Uh, error checking. For it's for error checking. Um, typically what it is is uh, it's the XOR of some other number of bits that precede it. Um, if you want to have odd parity anyway. So, oops. So let's, just, for example, say this is 1101. If I want, let's say, even parity. What that, what that means is I want to set P0, the first parity bit, to a value either 0 or 1. It's a bit, so those are the only values it can, can hold. In such a way that the first byte has an even number of 1s. Okay? So how many 1s does it have now? Four. Four. So, so what do I make P0? Zero. I'd make it a 0 because I want to preserve an even number of 1s. If I were doing odd parity, then I would make it a 1 so that I get 5 or an odd number of 1s. So really, this bit, this parity bit, is, is, is a fully deterministic function of the preceding 7. <coughs> it's not a free variable. You can't set it to whatever you feel like. It's computed based on the other 7. So essentially, it's not a key bit. It's not something that the user can choose. It's determined based on the other 7. Now, it's there for error checking purposes. You know, the pitch from the NSA would be, hey, now look, we added some error checking, so if you get a key that you receive from a peer, and it's got bad parity, you reject the key and you say something happened, data corruption, something's bad here, right? But of course, technologists were going, wait a minute, you just removed a bit of key for every byte, and there are eight bytes. You took out eight bits of key, which is true. So this is effectively a 56-bit key. Do you understand why? Those parity bits are not part of what a hacker, attacker, would have to guess. When you're exhaustively searching, you only have to search those 56. Parity bits are are for free. Yeah. Did the NSA at the time of implementing tell people that eight bits have been used as parity bits? They uh, said we make the following adjustments to the S boxes and we added parity bits. No comments. No explanation why, motivations, reasons, nothing. That's this is what's this is what we're doing. It's like Kirch the Kirchhoff's principle, key must be secret that as well. Sorry? Oh, Kirchhoff's principle? Yeah. That is that the That's a principle of, of security design. It's not a principle of, of politics of the NSA, right? Uh, politics of the NSA often is um, don't talk to anybody. Don't say what you did at work today. And if you have to say something, say the minimum possible. Right? Otherwise, radio silence. Which is probably the right policy for a secrecy agent, secret agency. Okay. So... Uh, there are only two of the 56, I say only, it's still a big number, but it's not horrendously huge. Remember our table of things? It's still a, still a bit of work. Um, so how many keys on average, if you're just searching randomly through the key space exhaustively trying to stumble upon the correct DES key, how many keys do you have to search? Well, what's the worst case? All of them. All of them, 2 to the 56. What's the average case? Half of them. Average. Half of them. What's half of 2 to the 56? 2 to the 55. So, you know, it's still a big number. Um, and this is, to do key search, we're going to assume we have a handful of plain text ciphertext pairs. In other words, we're going to have um, P and DES under some secret unknown hidden key. And you'll have some pairs here. And these are usually the ground rules of how to do exhaustive key search. You're given some input-output pairs. If you're only given ciphertext and said, hey, go find the key, there's no progress you can make, right? Unless you're, unless you're told when you find the key and you decipher this ciphertext, it's going to look like this. It's more, it's going to have this kind of shape or feel to it. But if you know nothing at all, if somebody says, if somebody takes random bits and enciphers them under DES with a random key and gives you the ciphertext only, 
you're wasting your time looking for the key. You won't recognize when you've won because you'll just get random bits for every trial you run. Right? So normally the rule is I'll give you the plain text and the cipher text, maybe a handful of them. Usually if you just get one right, you've won. But if you get it one right, one pair right, you should check them all. Make sure you've got the key correctly. And then the, um, and then the attack is usually it's parallelized. So usually we'll divide up the key space into pieces and assign each computer to exhaustively search its subset. Report back if it hit pay dirt or if it failed. Most will fail. Right. Um, the NSA could surely do this in, you know, who knows, a few days back in the 70s. And of course, with Moore's Law and speed ups, things have become easier. In 1994, 20 years after the ratification of DES as a standard, a Canadian cryptologist named Michael Weiner showed that you could build out of special purpose hardware for a million dollars that would find the key in an expected 3.5. So expected means, on average, 2, point, 2 to the 55 different trials, 3.5 hours. So this created a huge stir in the crypto community because it effectively meant that for a modest price, now a million dollars is still a lot these days. It was a lot more in 94. It's never been a lot for our government, right? Our government throws a billion dollars at things on a whim, let alone a million. And if you wanted to spend even more money, you could go even faster. So surely the NSA had one of these in its basement, or it had a whole farm of these in its basement, right? Uh, four years later, it went down to 35 minutes for a million dollars. And then finally, in 1997, this guy named Rock Verser, who I've never heard of before except for this one result, used 10,000 PCs to solve a DES challenge. So there were DES challenges issued out there. Who can break this? He went $10,000. And he was from Colorado. Um, so what, would ha what was happening in the late 90s is people were showing it was more and more plausible to break DES via exhaustive key search. And then finally, when I started doing crypto, which is in uh, 99, 98, the EFF, we talked about the EFF, remember? They built a special purpose using FPGAs, DES cracking machine, <coughs> which found that a key, could find a key in 56 hours, and this was for 210,000, so significantly cheaper. And people showed up to crypto with the special purpose chips on a keychain around their neck as a badge of honor. But the, the bottom line is DES had lived it out its useful lifetime, no longer was secure in the NSA, which it probably wasn't from the start, but it also wasn't secure even for normal users anymore, probably. DES has never been broken. Uh, its key is too small, so that's a fault, and that's never going to change. But um, no one's ever found an actual mathematical attack against it, so that's pretty good. And it's probably the most important cipher in the history of the planet, so uh, we'll take a quick look at how it works. Yes. You say a mathematical way to approach the key. What do you mean exactly? Oh, for example, our, our block cipher X, right? We don't have to try all possible keys to find how to break X. We put in zeros, out comes the key. That's, that's an intelligent attack that's not brute force, right? There's no, there's no known way, for example, if I give you a list of plain text, cipher text pairs in DES, I give you a bunch of them, a thousand of them. There's no way for you to just stare at that list and go, okay, I, I can extract the key. I see what the, what the key what key's being used here. There's no way for you that we know of to write an algorithm that will extract the key other than trying all keys. So that's a pretty good uh, track record, pretty good thing to be able to brag about. Has that ever happened in practice? I mean, yeah, in the lab, of course, but has, has there ever been a deployed, used uh, cryptography system that has been mathematically broken? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so what happened was um, back in the 70s, there were all these ciphers. They were called DES, uh, Loki, um, um, SEAL, um, BL64, um, Basimatic. You know what Basimatic is? 
No, nobody's old enough. When I first started teaching this class 15 years ago, people would laugh, and now everyone just looks at me because you keep getting younger. But uh, in Saturday Night Live, John Belushi days, Dan Aykroyd, they would have these fake commercials, and the fake commercial would be like, um, make a healthy smoothie out of a bass. You can with the bassomatic blender, and you just put a, a, a whole bass in there and hit a button, and it blends it up into a smoothie, which is supposed to be just disgusting, and it is. And so when Phil Zimmerman from Colorado also, came out with a system called PGP. You heard of that? Pretty good, Pretty good privacy. privacy. He was implementing RSA uh, crypto in open source free format. The NSA did not like this, did not like you and me having our hands on such powerful cryptography. They tried to put an injunction in place to prevent the distribution of it. But he needed a block cipher, because RSA is not a block cipher, it's a public key system. And so uh, he didn't trust Des. He decided to make his own, and he called it Bassomatic. It's horrible, right? Because he doesn't know how to write a block cipher. But anyway, so there were all these block ciphers in the 70s, Des being among them. And then in the 80s, scientists, um, specifically uh, Biham and Shamir, came up with this thing called differential cryptanalysis, this new idea how to break a block cipher. And it broke all of them, except... Des, because I've said Des has never been broken. And why do you think Des withstood the new attack? NSA knew about differential. NSA knew about differential cryptanalysis back when they tweaked the S boxes. So they fixed the S boxes of Des. Without commenting on why, because they, they didn't want to say, hey, we fixed it and here's why. Here's this cool attack that breaks everything in the world except for now this thing. <laughs> it was like, we're doing this, no comment. So everything but Des broke. So the, via mathematical approach is not via exhaustive case search. In fact, if I said as homework, everybody go home tonight and design me a block cipher. No, no, no cheating, no looking at other people's designs. I want you to just come up with something off the top of your head. Make it as complicated as you want. But it's got to be a block cipher. It's got to be one to one for any fixed key. 99% of the time, you're going to turn in something that's, that's breakable. It's pretty easily broken. The, uh, Differential cryptanalysis, sometimes, I've done this before, sometimes it's breakable just by staring at it and going, no, you just do that, out comes the key, right? I mean, it's, it's not easy to design crypto, and people who attempt it almost always get it wrong, unless you spend your life doing this. Okay. Anything else? All right, so here is, at a high level, how DES works. So it works on 64 bits, we mentioned the 64 bits come in, they go into this thing called the IP, the initial permutation, that is a, basically just scrambles the bits up. There's nothing cryptographic. There's no key in here. And then, uh, I think I have a better picture here. Yeah. And then it splits the 64 bits into two halves, 32 bits here and 32 bits here. The right side goes through a function called f that also ingests some of the key, the key bits. Remember, there's a key in here as well. And out comes 32 bits. And then they're XORed together. And then that output goes over to here. And this wire, not only did it go to f, but it also went over here unchanged and so forth. And you just keep doing this. And you do this 16 times. These times are called rounds. <coughs> Each application of F with the wires crisscrossing is called one round. There's 16 rounds. And then there's, again, a non-cryptographic operation at the end called the final permutation, FP. And then the 232s are blended back into 64, and out comes the ciphertext. Okay? All the cryptographic strength of DES relies on F being well designed. All right. So before we can even decide whether this DES thing is a block cipher, we have to make sure that if I fix the key, which means all these Fs are fixed, that this is invertible, that it's one to one. In other words, given a cipher text, I can go back up this ladder and recover the inputs. Okay. So 
Let's look a little bit closely, more closely at one round. This is one round. Of Des. And let's convince ourselves that it's possible to go up the picture. Okay? So here's 32 bits, the left side on the ith round. And we already said that the right side goes through F, but it also gets copied unchanged to become the new left side. The right side also goes through this F thing, which ingests both 32 bits here and 48 bits here. And this 48 bits is derived out of that master key. The master key was how long? 56. 56. So we're selecting 48 of those 56 to put into F. F's doing something inside. It's got these things called the S boxes inside that NSA tweaked. And after it finishes processing, out come 32 bits. Then that is XORed with these 32, and you get a new right side. And therefore, you're going from 64 bits to 64 bits as a function of this round key in F. Can we invert? In other words, is it a permutation? Is it one-to-one? -one? So let me ask you to figure that out for me. So given this value and this value, I want you to recover Li and L R sub I. Now note that F itself is not a permutation. So you cannot go up through F. You can only go down through F. So how would you do it? It's invertible. Yeah, it's it's invertible. not invertible. You need the key to get it. You have the key. You have the key. Then it's invertible. Then it's invertible. How do you R do it? Ri plus 1 is Li. Ri. No, sorry. Li plus 1 is Ri. Okay. So this one is easy, right? Yeah. These it's wires I. are the same. So then this is just Li, Li plus 1. Yeah. Then how do you... How do you then recover this one? The key is with the F. Li plus 1, and the key will go into the F function. Okay, so then you process in this direction. Yeah. Right? You've recovered Ri, because it's the same as Li plus 1. That was just copied. You process, you put this through in the, in the downward direction through F, along with the key. You get this wire. Yeah. And then what do you do? The, uh, XOR. XOR that with Ri plus 1. Ah, you XOR that and... X or that and that, and it gives you back this value. Yeah. So this value is R sub I plus 1 X or F of the key and L I plus 1. Now the right, so R I is just L I plus 1, and the L I is this more complicated expression. You agree? And this is deterministically computable. There's no randomness. There's no guessing. It's, uh, you need the key, which is what we want. We don't want people deciphering without the key. And if you can do this for one round, you can just keep doing this all the way up the ladder till you get back out the top, right? So given the key, for any fixed key, this is a one-to-one -one mapping. You can go either direction. Questions? Okay. So here's some questions uh, that we might come to mind when you're looking at this design. Why do we um, why do we have so many rounds? I mean, obviously, the more rounds you have, the slower your algorithm is going to be. So what if we only had one round? What if this was Des in its entirety? <clears throat> you could you could guess. You could guess what? Every round has. A different round key. Yeah, every ra every one of these round these these are called round keys. There's a there are different 48 bits that are taken out of the master 56 bit key each round. But what if I just said no? Nah, we'll just have one round. Yeah. Doesn't that make your exhaustive key search only two to the 48? It would make your exhaustive key search only two to the 48, which is a problem because it's even smaller, right? It's even Keep it smaller yet again. But there's a bigger problem than that. You got you know half of the uh, you know you know what L I plus one is. Okay. So my block cipher simply how thirty two bits of the input are 
exposed it directly in the output, we don't like that, right? Yeah. When we encipher, we want to encipher stuff. We want to mix it up, make it look random. The chances that a random permutation would take the right half of the input and always produce it as the left half of the output are essentially zero. I mean, it's not going to happen. And therefore, doing that in, in, a, in, a, in one round of DES is not a good block cipher. It's not secure. It is a block cipher. But you can tell. It's just a bad block cipher, right? It's not the identity, but it's, it's the identity on 32 bits of the 64. So we don't like that. So there's not enough mixing up. Now, if you keep doing this over and over, are both halves going to get mixed up? Right? Yeah, because on the odd rounds, the right half is being copied over, but on the even rounds, the other right half is being copied over, and they keep switching sides. So both halves are going to go through this F box eight times. So isn't that like this similar to a chain block cipher then? But it's just, I guess, when you're doing the, when you're putting the, the only difference is like the, where you put the, you know. Where um, the, yeah. I mean, cipher block chaining is, is different because we're taking different parts of the message and processing it. Here, I'm taking the same parts and processing them over and over, the same thing. Because I just want to put them through that blender, and make sure all the bits are getting properly intermixed. They call this a confusion-diffusion primitive. Confusion is the mixing up, and diffusion is making sure that all the bits interact through the process. Because we want the following behavior in particular. If I take DES, or any block cipher, but let's say DES, and I put in two inputs. I put in all zeros. How many zeros is this? 64. 64. Put in 64 zero bits under some key that's inside. I don't care what key it is. And then I put in all zeros except for that last bit is a 1. Okay, so I'm putting in two values that are almost identical. What should my outputs look like? They're random. They should look unrelated, right? So even if I just change the input by one bit, I don't expect that the ciphertext will look at all similar. <laughs> because in a random permutation, they wouldn't look at all similar. In a random permutation, you know, you just you put in zeros, you put in one, you put in two. These guys are independently generated as long as they don't repeat, because it's a permutation, so you can't repeat. But they look, should look like just the shuffle of the deck of cards of all 64-bit strings. And they, just because they're adjacent in the table, they shouldn't look at all similar. So I need to simulate that somehow with my algorithm. But even similar-looking inputs produce dissimilar-looking outputs, no correlation. In order to get that effect, I need to churn through my 16 rounds of DES, I need to mix all these bits up. OK. So, um, so one round, no good. It's clear, and how do you beat it with the, uh, the black box game? Remember our black boxes, random permutation versus one round of DES? What do you do? Put in anything and then see if half the message is the same. There you go. Put in anything you want, and if the right half of anything you want moved over to the left half of the output, you're like, this is probably one round of DES. Because most random permutations wouldn't have the behavior. And if you're not sure, do it some more. And if the right half keeps moving to the left, you get exponentially surer and surer that it's one round of DES. Because the chances a random permutation will behave like this on every input you try are extremely low. OK. What about two rounds? Now, two rounds, you're going to process both sides. So you don't have this simple test saying, if the right half goes to the left half, we're done. In two rounds, both halves will get some attention from the F box, from that F, that F function, right? How do you break it? So I'm not going to tell you. It requires, I don't know, anywhere from a minute to an hour of thought, depending on how quickly it occurs to you. But you should go think about it. I might put something on the midterm about this, just letting you know. Is the question clear? What am I asking you here? What does that mean, break it? Yeah, just see if it's a good or bad cipher, right? In what, in what context? Uh, 
uh, comparing it against a okay. random permutation. Okay. So when I, when I want you to break it, I mean write down an attack that describes a strategy, an algorithm, where you say, okay, well, put in this. You can, you can choose a particular value you like, or you can just say put in a random value. And then probably you need a few queries. So then you say, then put in this, then do this. And at the end, run this final check. And if this happens, I think it's two rounds of DES. And if this doesn't happen, I think it's random. Isn't this very similar from distinguishing pi from the, uh, the thing we are talking about earlier? Because you... X? Yeah. You X, was, X was easy. This is, is yeah, a bit so harder. You can, XOR, you can XOR it at first 80, 32, and then... So tell again. So then the right side will be the XOR of the first of the first right side value. I think it's harder than you think. It is. Yeah. I mean, it's not super hard, but it requires some careful thought. And it's at least to me, I if you said, you know, if you said, I'll give you a million dollars if you can say it in ten seconds, I'd be like, I just lost it because I, I can't. And I would have to think it through, double check. I mean, there's some steps involved, but you can do it. If you understand what we're talking about this game with the black boxes and you understand DES to the level we've described it, you're done. Okay, so why don't we just use a few rounds? Well, one is stupid. Two is breakable by a class of graduate students in, you know, an hour of effort. <laughs> um, and it turns out up to eight rounds is broken using what's called differential cryptanalysis, this technique. So DES has 16 rounds. Why? Because people thought 15 was too small. I mean, it's an engineering decision, right? If you say, well, eight rounds breaks, and I don't want to go to nine rounds because we like even numbers. So both the left and half and the right half get the same amount of love from the block cipher. So let's keep it even. Or how about 10? Well, if it breaks at 8, then 10 doesn't seem like enough. Let's go to 16. That's the power of 2. And we don't know how to break more than 8, though. Differential cryptanalysis does break DES, but it breaks DES with the amount of work more than an exhaustive key search would take. So you wouldn't count that, right? This is what the F function looks like inside. This was called F on the other slides. Remember, F takes 32 bits in and a 48-bit round key. Or this is these are some of the master key bits that are fed into the round. And this is any one of the rounds. Every round has an F in it. And this is what F looks like every time. The only thing that varies is this key. This key won't be the same every time. Well, and then the 32 bits coming in won't be the same every time as you churn through that picture. So what happens is this 32 goes through a box called E. It turns it into 48. There's no involvement of the key inside of E. It's just a, it's just, it takes the 32 and it copies 16 of them a second time to give you 48. This 48 is XORed with that 48 to give you another 48. And then the magical S boxes happen. The S boxes are not secret. They're published. You can get them on Wikipedia or anywhere on the web. They're part of the specification of DES, which, according to Kirchhoff's principle, is a public algorithm. Only the key is the secret. So everybody knows how DES works. These S boxes take six bits into four, so it's a compression function, which means that 48 goes into what? Every six goes into four? 24. 32. There's a final non-cryptographic step here that mixes these bits up called P, and that's it. So F takes in a 32-bit one left side or right side, right side of the DES ladder, 48-bit round key, does some stuff, outputs 32 bits. Um, if these S boxes were really simple maps, in other words, let's say I've got an S box. These S boxes are the same every round. They don't change per round. S1 is S1 is S1 all the way down 16 times. S2 is different from S1, but it's the same all the way through all 16 rounds. I could design an S-box. I could say, take these wires, these six wires, 
ignore these outer two, and then just copy the, uh, the middle four. That's an S-box. It doesn't have to be a permutation. It can't be, because you can't map six bits to four and not have a collision based on the pigeonhole principle. You've got to have two different inputs mapping to the same output, right? This is a dumb S-box. And if you replace all of these good S-boxes with eight copies of my dumb S-box, DES will break. And I sometimes assign this as extra credit in this class. I say, go look up DES, get all the specifics, the details, replace the S-boxes with my dumb S-box, and then here's some plain text ciphertext pairs, go break the key. And you don't have to do exhaustive key search. You can actually do some math and extract the key. Because if the S-boxes are bad, the whole house of cards crumbs, comes crumbling down. So it's important that the NSA improved those S-boxes to, to make DES strong. The entire strength of DES rests on the security of those boxes. I don't mean the secrecy of them. I mean the security of them. OK? Uh, I think I said all this, but here's some notes for you if uh, you can write it down. There are more details. In particular, how do you get the 48-bit round key out of the master key? That's another algorithm. It's called the key scheduling algorithm. You can go look it up if you're interested. Um, if you do want to do the challenge problem that I just mentioned, then you'll need to know all the details. Uh, if you want to do the challenge problem, I will give you extra credit. It's hard. I, I'll put it on the homework, the first homework. Um, it's hard. You shouldn't do it unless you've done all your other school work, all the homework in this class. You've showered, called your mom, eaten a good meal, got plenty of sleep, then work on this. Right? <laughs> but some people sometimes will get obsessed with uh, extra credit problems, and they, this is going to be harder than the regular homework and work, worth fewer points. So you, you want to prioritize accordingly. Also, you should know linear algebra reasonably uh, well, like how to do Gaussian road reductions. Questions? Yeah. Is the same 48-bit subkey put into every um, F function, or is that different subsets of the 50? So it looks something like this. So let's say this is your 56-bit master key. There's an algorithm called the key schedule algorithm. And, it'll, and you, input, you input into it this K and what round key you would like. And so for round one, you might take, like, you know, this is key sub one. These are the bits we're going to use for the first round key. You need 48 of them. For round two, this is K2, and that's the one you put in. So it's a different subset. How many different subsets of size 48 are there in the 56-bit key? 56 c 48. 56 choose 48. You know this? Know this notation? Yeah. yeah. That's a lot. I mean, it's not it's not phenomenal, but it's it's a lot more than 16. So you have plenty of different ways to choose. Right? And this is. 56 times 55 times 54 is 49, 48 factorial. Um, sorry. Yes. Yes. 8, 8 factorial. What is it, 8 factorial? 8 factorial. Yeah, 8 factorial, sorry. So that's a lot. But we only need 16 different subsets. Is it possible that you take 16 different round keys out of this master key and you never reuse the same master key twice? Like every bit is used only in one round key. Mm. Or is it some case? In some cases, some bit is going to have to be used at least twice. It has to be. Yeah. You don't have enough bits, right, for every bit to say, hi, I'm bit 14. I'm only used in round key 10, nowhere else. You can't do that because you don't have enough bits. You don't have 48 times 16 bits. You only got 56. So a lot of these bits are being used over and over as part 
of different round keys, but they're probably being put into different places on the round key, and it's all according to this algorithm, this, this key scheduling algorithm. Anything else? Okay, so we can't use DES. Even in the 70s, you can't really use DES. Its key is too short. Even given the fact that itself it's a strong cipher, its key is too short. So what should we do? So people were grappling with this question. They knew the key was too short. They wanted to use DES, but uh, they needed to figure out how to improve it so that they could uh, circumvent this issue with a short key. So let's write DES like this. DES sub K of P. P is a plain text K key. And double DES is another 64-bit block cipher. In other words, it's uh, plain text and cipher text are both 64 bits. But its key is 112. Where does that come from? 56 into 2. 56 and plus 56. It's two, got two regular old DES keys combined together. So its key is still called K, but it's got two 56-bit keys that comprise the 112-bit master key. And here's how you do a double DES. You double DES as follows. You double DES of K, which is 112 bits, on P, which is how many bits? 64. You compute it like this. You do a DES on K1. And then whatever comes out, you put that through DES with K2. So you just compose DES with itself. right? Or if you did it in pictures, it'd be like this, right? Let's see. Uh, how fast is this? Twice as slow as this. So it's, right? Because you have to, you can't parallelize, right? Can you parallelize? No. Yeah, you got to compute one and then the other. Um, DES is already a slow algorithm, even today. Other block ciphers are faster. Now it's twice as slow, so we don't like that. Um, if you're an attacker, do you get to have this middle wire? You're an attacker? Yeah, let's say double DES is a block cipher. When you were doing playing this game about per random permutation versus double DES, trying to distinguish which one is which. No, I mean, that's, this is an internal part of the algorithm. You don't get to have that. So the thing you get, if you're trying to do exhaustive key search, is you get plain text, ciphertext pairs. These are double DES plain text, ciphertext pairs. And now, if you're trying to do exhaustive key search, how many do you have to try? Two to the 112. Two to the 112 of them. You can't, you can't hope to get that, right? Um, nowhere close. So it would seem like this solves the problem. At least exhaustive key search is not possible. So it turns out this doesn't work. And I'll show you why. So there's something called, hopefully I can still write. No, I cannot. Because, of course, it resets. There's something called a meet in the middle attack. And it has the unfortunate same acronym as the man in the middle attack, which is far more common and important for you to know. But this is the meet in the middle attack. It only applies to double DES. I shouldn't say that. There's some new research now that's using meet in the middle uh, approaches against other things. But for your for your life, probably all you care about is uh, the, the meet in the middle in the context of double DES. So here's the idea. Once again, you've got a, a lot of plain text ciphertext pairs, 10 or 20 of them. 
You know what I mean when you, I say you have plain text, ciphertext pairs? What does that mean? You've got an input in the corresponding in cipher, ciphertext under double des using some hidden key that you would love to get your hands on. <coughs> but we have already said you cannot exhaustively search for it. You won't finish in your lifetime, right? And I'm saying you don't have to. <coughs> so what you do is let's say you've got P0, C0, P1, C1, P2, C2. You've got a handful of these things. You take P0 and you encipher it under DES with all keys. So you do and for every one of these so I'm saying you hold the plain text still and you just try all keys and you make a list of all the outputs store them in memory or whatever how many keys do you have to try to, in order to try them all? This is just one DES invocation, not two. Two to 56. And I guess if I'm going to be absolutely technical, I'll be two to 56 minus one because I started at zero and we're computer scientists and we do this funky stuff, right? But there are two to 56 different keys. And now I take C0 and I decipher under every possible key. Same set of keys. And this is going to yield also a bunch of 64 bit springs that I tabulate. And then the final step is I look for a match in the middle somewhere, right? Like if this value over here matches that value over here, what does that mean? I find a match. All the key, each half of the key. It doesn't mean that. I mean, it might be there are a bunch of matches, so I'm not sure it's the key. I would have to check, you know, maybe I check it against some of the other values to make sure it really is the key. But what does it for sure mean if I find a match in this table? Say this was K, I don't know. Something down here. means for sure that it means that des sub k1 sorry nine one two two four of P0 it means that if I take P0 and I put it through DES with this key and then I put it through DES with that key I get C0 so I have found a key namely the concatenation of K sub 91224 and K1 that produces a map from P0 to C0. It doesn't mean it's the one because there could be a bunch of different matches in this table. So then I should try P1, C1, P2, C2 and if it works for all of them I can be very confident I found it. Right? Okay, so this is called the meet in the middle attack for obvious reasons because you're looking for a, a match down the middle of this table. Uh, Let's talk about the practicality of this table, of this approach. It does work, right? I mean, you're gonna, if you find all matches, one of those matches is going to be the key. It's a 112-bit key. How much time does it take to build this side of the table? 
256. And what about this side? 256. So total? 257. That's a lot less than 2 to the 112. <coughs> right? Now, a couple of details I just swept under the rug. Um, you tell me, what else do we have to worry about? You have to save all this somewhere? And memory, right? That's a lot of memory. I mean, I guess if you're, you know, the NSA, maybe you can uh, afford this much memory, but it's it's substantial. Um, how how big are these outputs? 64 bits. 64 bits, 8 bytes. So I have 8 bytes space times 2 to the 56 plus the other table. So it's 2 to the 57, 64 bytes. Um, so this is what? A lot. 2 to the 60 bytes. And what's a, what's a gigabyte? 2 to the 30. 2 to the 30? Okay. And what's a terabyte? Double that, 60. 2 to the 40. 2 to the 40? So this is a million, roughly, terabytes. Anybody have a million terabytes? Nobody? Uh, it's not easy to get your hands on yet. So this is prohibitive. So what would you do about space? There's probably space-time trade-offs you can do. There are space-time trade-offs you can do, which is we'll accept a bit more uh, computational burden in exchange for using less space. Or you can start using disk drives, although disk drives, you're still not at a million terabytes, right? I mean, terabytes are only 50 bucks these days. But actually getting a million drives, you know, and powering them all at the same time, and getting a controller that can handle that, and trying to hurry up and do your experiment before one of them breaks, uh, not practical. So you probably go to some space-time trade-off. But you can. You can figure that out. The other issue is uh, finding these matches, right? You're going to need some kind of a hash table or something. You need some kind of data structure, but that's not too bad. Okay, so because of the man in the, because of the meat in the middle attack, and this describes it, what it is, because of the meat in the middle attack, this computational complexity is too low, and therefore no one uses double des. Not now, not then. Everybody knew about this attack right out of the gate. This was not something that was discovered years later and So nobody uses double DES. How about triple DES? <laughs> right? If two is not enough, maybe three works. So here's triple DES, just exactly as how you would design it yourself if you had to. It uses three keys, each 56 bits. Three times 56, 168-bit master key. And it iterates DES on itself three times. This one works. As far as we know, there are no known attacks against triple DES, including exhaustive key search. You could do a meet in the middle attack with triple DES, but what you'd have to do is you'd have to put two DESs on one side and one DES on the other, and then try to meet in the middle there. And then you're hosed. Why? Yeah, one Because one side's going to have two DESs which is 112 bits of key that you can't exhaustively search, or you can't tabulate 202 to the 112. So you can choose which point to attack, but either side, either way you do it, there's going to be a double des on one side or the other. And that's going to be prohibitively expensive. And so therefore, exhaustive key search has 112 bits of security, which is prohibitive for an attacker. Triple DES is well known, widely standardized, uh, used in the banking industry. Remember I said the banks still use DES? They don't use single DES, and they don't use double DES. They use triple DES. Um, when you look at cipher suites, you'll see triple DES listed. Um, probably the most common version of triple DES that's used is called two-key triple DES in EDE format, which stands for Encipher, Decipher, Encipher. And the key here is actually not 168 bits, it's only 5, 112 bits. And what they do is they take K1, K2, each 56 bits. 
You encipher under K1, you decipher under K2, and you encipher again under K1. So they like this better because it's only 112 bits that you have to carry around your pocket, not 168. Um, is it important? Would it be okay if I had said this is K2 and this one's K1? That's a single DES. That's a single DES. Yeah. Why is it a single DES? Because you're decrypt, you just get the plain text. The, the, the two inside DESs cancel, right? So I would never do this. That was really annoying. And now it's locked up. Anybody have uh, Bill Gates' home phone number? <laughs> No, PowerPoint's dead. Um, so anyway, uh, triple DES is still widely used in usually legacy applications, uh, ATM machines, some of the financial sectors. And when we get to OpenSSL, which we'll be doing soon, remember I told you it's this open source, widely used software package. We'll, you'll look at the Cypher suites, you will see triple DES available there. It's still available in a lot of web browsers and so forth, even though you shouldn't be using it anymore. The issues with triple DES are not that it's weak. Um, the issues are 64-bit block size, right? Because it's just DES three times. Where we have better 128-bit block sizes like AES. And the other thing is, what do you think? What's bad about triple DES? Slow. Slow. Because slow. DES is slow. And three times slow is really slow, right? So if you don't care about performance and you need to be compliant, then maybe you just use it. But if you wanted to build something today, you would use AES. And we'll describe AES next time when PowerPoint wakes back up uh, on Monday. Okay, any questions? Yeah. Is the, why can't you change the key scheduling algorithm just to accept a bigger key? Or is it? You could, you could, you could, you could, you could change DES to make a bigger key but then you are inventing your own block cipher at that point because you're actually messing with the insides. The nice thing about triple DES is you're not touching DES. You're just making a choo-choo train out of them, right? So, and that seems a lot less invasive, so people feel better. But it's a religious thing. It's not a technical thing. You could be a genius at block cipher design, at which point you really should just throw DES out and design a better one, which is what we've done these days anyway. All right. Have a good weekend, which is a funny thing to say on a Wednesday, but. No, Microsoft.